people are trickling in now, so we'll get started in just another minute. Welcome friends. Thank you for joining the Gordon JCC for the Nashville Jewish Book Series on this lovely spring day. I'm Sharon Bennis, the Adult and Community Wives Program Director, and I'm excited to introduce our moderator for the evening and the author. But before we begin, if you um, need closed captioning, you can go down to the bottom of your screen in the right corner and um, click on the CC button and select subtitles. If you have a question during the conversation, please place it in the chat and then we'll get to it during the Q&A time. <laughs> we would appreciate if everyone would make sure that their microphone is muted before we begin. Additionally, we are also recording the event. So if for some reason you wanna rewatch it, we will have that on our YouTube channel. We're so excited for tonight. Oh, and we also have some links in the chat as well, the link for the book. So you can um, go ahead and go purchase it. Uh, we are so excited tonight. This is our ninth event of this season. And we have Benendetta Jasmine Guetta, who will be speaking about her book, Cooking Alajudia, Alajudia, uh, a celebration of Jewish food of Italy. And she will be in conversation with Natasha Senyanovich, who is one of our Nashville Jewish Book Series reporter, um, sorry, <laughs> committee members, and also a reporter who um, lived in Italy and worked there for, what, 16 years, and she speaks fluent Italian and is full of knowledge from her lived experiences there. Benedetta Jasmine Guetta is an Italian food writer and photographer. She was born in Milan, but she lives in Santa Cruz, Santa Monica, California. In 2009, she co-founded a website called Lebna. Um, it's the only Jewish and Italian uh, Jewish kosher cooking blog in Italy, specializing in Italian and Jewish cuisine. Since then, she has been spreading the word about the marvels of Italian Jewish food in Italy and abroad, teaching the recipes of the cuisine to a growing number of people in cooking schools, synagogues, and community centers, among other institutions. Her work has been featured in numerous news outlets in Italy and abroad, including the Washington Post, Cosmopolitan, El, um, A Table, Savior, and Tablet. Benedetta has previously co-authored two books in Italian, and this is her first English language cookbook. So without further ado, I introduce you to Natasha Sanyanovich, our moderator for the evening, and Benedetta Jasmine Guetta. Hi, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Benedetta, for, for being with us. Um, yes, yeah, this is the link to the book, and it's a beautiful book. And I have earmarked so many recipes already that I'm going to try um, that I have not yet. Um, so before before we jump in, uh, and as you can see from the slide, you know uh, the, the the question that you that you will be answering is: Are there Jews? Are there really Jews in Italy? Um, I wanted to ask you know you as Sharon mentioned, you've been writing this this blog for about fifteen years, um, sharing kosher and Jewish recipes from Italy, from the Middle East, and beyond. What inspired this cookbook? Now, um, that's a very valid question. Before we even begin, I want to apologize to everybody for the fact that I have this really sort of weird situation where I'm at. I got the time wrong for the meeting today, so I'm in a car. I just want to apologize to everybody. I'm here and I'm going to give you the best talk ever, despite the circumstances. Uh, now, to answer your question, um, when I decided to write this book. Um, so this book came together from a number of factors, mostly the research that I was doing for my blog, because there was so much curiosity towards uh, um, Jewish culture and in particular towards Jewish Italian culture that I just started um, trying to collect recipes and record um, stories from different sources, grandmothers all over the country. So as I was traveling and meeting all of these people and trying to gather um, recipes, I had this really urgent sense of... Uh, um, 
something that was going to get lost if I didn't try to save it. Um, Italy has about uh, um, 35,000 Jews. This, it's a very small community. And within this community, the population is really aging. Um, so there is a number of recipes and stories um, and traditions that are on the verge of getting lost just because, uh, um, because of the demographic factor. So after years of collecting recipes, I really had um, some, this sense of responsibility in a way towards our culture to try and save all of those recipes from oblivion. Um, I can't do much for the general culture, but food is my thing. So I figured that at least for what pertains to food, I could. Oh, we lost you for a second. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> No, that was actually the end of my sentence. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Um, so your your food your the cookbook is also like a historical road trip because you I mean it's not uncommon for cookbooks to to offer a look you know to examine a region where recipes come from, but you offer this this history that dates back centuries. Um, and looking at some of the biggest regions where where the most where the the greatest number of Jewish communities were, um, and you give us and you give us uh, you know sort of a, a breakdown, a chronology of what happened over the years. Um, can you give us a little bit? Do you want to start with a little bit of a historic overview? Sure, uh, it's in your cookbook. And, and just to let everyone know, um, I am in charge of the slides, and I don't uh, so. Forgive me. <laughs> so it's all good. No, no, it's my fault because, like I said, um, no, no, no it's right. has planned today. But we got in this. the virtual world, right? In the we've all been living a Zoom life, and and we all know what how it goes. <laughs> That's not a problem. So um, let's stick for a second for a second to the slide we're at, uh, which just brings me back for a moment at the reason why I wrote the book, and then we can move on to the history, which is a really important part. So one of the reasons why I wrote this book was to tell the story of the Jews of Italy. Because uh, among other things, when I moved to the U.S., I realized that, that uh, um, people barely know that the Jews of, East, of Italy exist. Um, and that's a real pity, because while we're not a big community, we're a community with a very interesting history, like you were starting to point out. Um, and then when they have heard about Italy, they generally only have heard about uh, um, the Jewish cuisine of Rome, um, which is just a fraction, again, of the variety and the richness of our culture. Because uh, because um, all across the peninsula, there are uh, different recipes and different uh, um, customs and traditions that were totally worth recording. So when I, when I set out to write this book, I tried to not only do justice to our history, but also, like you pointed out, to our geography. Um, I might just have you skip slide for me, if you can be so kind, go to the one after. There we go. So one of the really interesting things about uh, um, the Jews of Italy is that the Italian uh, diaspora, if we want to call it that way, is one of the oldest, uh, probably the oldest in the world. Um, and what is very peculiar about it is that the Jews of Italy are unlike any other Jews. They're not Sephardi and they're not Ashkenazi. Um, they are, in fact, their own thing, because um, the very, very, uh, very early settlers, if we want to call it that way, Jewish settlers in Italy, um, came to Italy during the Judeo-Roman Wars. So we're talking um, millennia ago. So this community has been growing in Italy um, very independently from the development of every other Jewish community in the world. Eventually, we did absorb communities from other places, but there's a route that is rather unique. Um, and that translates obviously also um, to the cuisine. So um, well, we will get to talk about it later, but for example, you will never find on our table, you know, matzo balls or gefilte fish. Um, we just have our own independent um, way of developing the culture and that included uh, the cuisine. Can I have you um, change slide again for the next one? Um, so I try not to bore people with a lot of history when I give these talks. However, a tiny bit of history is um, really essential for us to place the food in context. Um, why? Because other than the day that I pointed out at the beginning, the Judeo-Roman Wars, there's a couple of historic milestones um, that are really relevant to the way our cuisine developed. 
So I'll keep them at the absolute minimum. Uh, you don't even need all the bits that we have on this slide, uh, but at least a few. One very important one uh, is the alarm. Oh, we were expelled from Spain. Can you still hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah, you, 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 we lost the audio for a second. Very good. Um, so the Alhambra decree is really relevant to our history because Italy, uh, people don't really know at the time, belonged to Spain. Southern Italy, and particularly Sicily, uh, belonged to the Kingdom of Spain. So when the Jews were expelled from Spain, uh, they were also expelled from Southern Italy. And that triggered a number of, um, um, how do I say, gastronomical events that I will talk, uh, that I will tell you about later. Uh, another couple of days that you need to keep in mind are the creation of the ghettos, respectively in, respectively in Venice and in Rome. That is because um, while we think about ghettos as a negative um, item, uh, as a really uh, negative historical creation, from a culinary and cultural perspective uh, in the Jewish uh, experience, the ghetto also had a silver lining. Uh, in fact, the existence of ghettos allowed us to preserve a number of uh, um, recipes and stories and traditions that would have otherwise gotten lost. Uh, the fact that Jews were uh, constrained in specific quarters um, determined substantially the way uh, they ended up eating and cooking. So just keep in mind these two dates also relevant for us later. Uh, and I, mean, I will word, just keep the, the word rest. ghetto, right? I mean, the word ghetto comes from the comes word from itself. Venetian ghetto dialect. comes from correct comes from the from the Venetian dialect. Uh, yeah, so you see, it's, it's not a great thing to be proud of the invention of ghettos, but uh, on the bright side, from a from a culinary historical perspective, it was a really helpful thing. Um, can I just have you go to the next slide, please? Very good. So when I started writing this book, I tried to answer substantially a question, what is Jewish Italian food? And to a certain degree, how did the Jewish um, cuisine influence Italian cuisine? And how did Italy with its uh, um, culture, situ situ economical situation, political situation influence the way the Jews of Italy ate? Uh, and the reason why this is interesting, I think, is that um, when we think about Italian food, we tend to paint it with a really broad brush because everybody agrees that pizza is great and pasta is amazing. Um, but a lot of the subtleties that uh, compromise sort of like the patchwork of Italian food uh, tend to get lost. And I do like to reiterate, and that was, I guess, one of my obsessions, that uh, one of the substantial contributions to Italian food, as we call it today, has come from its Jewish population. Now, unfortunately, the Jewish population is so small, um, from just from a bare numerical perspective, uh, that uh, this aspect has been sort of forgotten. Uh, but when you start digging deep in the roots of um, many recipes and many um, Italian foods, there really is uh, a clear Jewish influence. So that was another thing that I tried to um, record in the book. If you look at this picture, for example, here um, that I have on my deck, uh, this plate of orecchiette. Orecchiette are an Italian dish, everybody agrees. They come from Southern Italy, from the region of Apulia. And everybody would tell you, yes, they're an Italian dish. Uh, we invented it in Apulia. And every time I come on the scene and talk to people, I need to be the party pooper and say, look, they're Italian, true. You eat them in Apulia, also true. Uh, but they didn't come from there. They came from uh, the south of France, from Provence. Uh, and it was the Jews that brought them. And when you think about it, there's pretty much only one religion, and it's a bummer that is now almost passed over because this story is nice around for him. There's pretty much only one religion uh, where we eat the ears, the osne of our enemies. Uh, it's the osne aman. Um, the orecchiette were born out of a Purim tradition because um, they're so in the shape of the mean ears. ears. Orecchiette mean little ears. Correct. Yeah, yeah sorry, I did, did I forget? <laughs> or it means later years. So there's pretty much only one culture in which we go around eating uh, the ears of our enemy, and that's the story of Purim. So, um, so that's, for example, is one of those moments when I tell people, look, there's a Jewish story here. And everyone is surprised because they don't really know. So I set out to record these stories, and if not to record them, to at least bring them to light. 
for more people to um, discover. Um, can I have you change slide again, please? And I was going to say, I mean, for me, and as much as I, I love this dish, I love orecchiette with, with broccoli rum, but it's not even having lived in Italy all those years. It's exactly like you said, it is just considered a, a, a dish from Puglia. And there's, there's yeah. never- and, and nobody wants to dig deeper into the history and figure out it's not. And when I tell them, they're so bummed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that's a lot because there's a lot of recipes in this book that are just considered, you know, they've been appropriated. They are just sort of your- Typical Italian food, or maybe regional from from one area, but but not never associate anymore with with Jewish tradition. Correct. I I don't like to use the word appropriated because it feels really strong, but definitely some recipes or ingredients also, uh, as we will see in the next slide, ingredients where the original root or the story of that dish has been sort of forgotten. I, and when people say appropriated, it's, it's often some sort of, I feel like it, 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 it has a violent um, sort of meaning to it. I think this was just sort of like the inevitable passing of time and the fact that the Jewish um, community is so small in Italy that it doesn't have enough cultural representation. That's, that's just, that's a numerical issue. Um, and to go back to the, what I was saying about the ingredients, for example, it's not only the dishes, uh, the whole uh, Jewish influence goes back to the ingredients. So for example, um, I've got here in my slides on the left, uh, caponata. A caponata is a Sicilian dish which features eggplants, tomatoes, capers, then depending who you ask, olives, uh, people throw all sorts of things in a caponata. Um, but it's, just, it's a sweet and sour dish that often also has um, raisins as an ingredient. Now, this whole combination of ingredients uh, is a quintessentially Jewish combination. But in particular, the existence of uh, um, eggplant as a vegetable in our cuisine, which we totally take for granted, um, is actually a Jewish contribution. So today, when you think about eggplants uh, in Italian cuisine, you think about parmigiana, absolute classic dish. You think about pasta alla norma, another classic dish with eggplants. But it's not, it's not always been the case. Um, until a couple of centuries ago, Italians had no clue how to cook with eggplants. Um, they were very skeptical of this vegetable. They thought this vegetable could be potentially poisonous. Um, and it's recorded like in um, recipe books, uh, even really famous one, like uh, I, I tell that to Natasha because Natasha might have seen it before, even in the Pellegrino Artusi book, which is like one of the foundational books of Italian cuisine. Um, the eggplant is described as potentially poisonous, food fit for the dogs and for the Jews. Um, the Jews had I learned mean, to cook the with word, it. right? Melan melanzana is like a, a distorted, a, a, it's an unhealthy apple. Like the, 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 Correct. the translated. They were like really suspicious of it. Um, and it was pretty much the Jews um, who had learned to cook with these ingredients from uh, trading with the Arab world, with the Mediterranean world, from the Turkish, from all, you know, all of those um, populations that are across the sea uh, that brought this ingredient to Italy. They cooked with it because they knew it was delicious. By the way, it, it makes for a great meat substitute in a lot of dishes. So the Jews really appreciated it um, and they brought it to Italy. But it took, it took centuries for Italians to grow confident um, and adopt it. And it was literally just uh, the Jewish um, sort of um, influence that got them to uh, start appreciating it. Now, as I was saying, on the other side, when I started to write this book, there was another influence, uh, sort of the reverse uh, influence, the other flip of the coin that I tried to uh, record, which was how did Italy, with its political and social and economical situation, um, shaped the Jewish cuisine? Uh, and that's where we go back to the um, dates that I asked you to remember about the story of the ghettos, uh, specifically in Venice and Rome. Um, there's a few dishes that today we think of as local um, delicacies, very um, appreciated dishes um, that uh, the Jews contributed that are part of the Jewish cuisine uh, that pretty much came to be not because the Jews enjoyed cooking and had a great time, but because the Jews were locked in ghettos um, and were really struggling. Uh, these dishes, we really like them now, but that's not how they were born. They were born out of necessity and poverty. So I've got in this slide a couple of examples of stories that I like to tell. 
Um, on the top of the right side of the slide, you see a Roman fish soup. So the Roman fish soup is uh, today considered the local specialty in Rome. Everybody eats it, uh, delicious, rich dish made with great fishes. However, that hasn't always been the case. Um, the origin of this soup is much humbler than that. Um, so you need to imagine the Jews were locked in a ghetto. The ghetto was in a really undesirable quarter in Rome next to the Tiber River. Um, the poverty was dire, the situation was really hard. Um, and one of the reasons why that specific neighborhood was somewhat undesirable was that it was really close to the fish market. Now, nobody, nobody likes to live next to the fish market. It stinks, it's ugly. Um, the Jews were really poor. They couldn't afford to buy fancy fishes. However, they used to go to the market at the end of the market day and collect whatever scraps that they could find. Um, how would they cook them? They had to figure out a sanitary and healthy way to cook them because these scraps of fish had been sitting out all day. So the easiest way to cook them and make sure you didn't get food poisoning was to boil them. Um, add a few ingredients and that, how is, and that is how the Roman fish soup was born. Obviously today it's a much fancier version of it, but that was pretty much how the Roman fish soup started. Um, now we think of it as a great dish, but back then it was mostly a dish born out of necessity. Another similar story is the story of the dish that you see below, um, the alicciotti con l'indivia. Um, imagine uh, the fact that the Pope at some point decided that the Jews were only allowed to eat small um, fishes, not big ones, just the tiny ones, anchovies, um, sardines, why just out of you know trying to make their life difficult um so once you rule out being able to eat bigger fishes and you can only really cook with these ones and you put on top of that the fact that the um population was fairly poor what did the jewish women do they got themselves these tiny fishes and baked them with one of the vegetables that was readily available um, in most you know, courtyards. It was easy to grow uh, in Divya, which is this really bitter salad. Um, baked them in a dish together and got uh, um, what we today consider a local specialty. Was it always, uh, again, a fancy dish? No, uh, it was a dish born out of the conditions that the Jews were uh, forced into when they were living into the ghettos. Uh, can I have you change slide? Okay, we can skip my slide about eating kosher because I'm optimistic. We all know roughly what that entails. Um, and I can tell you about, the, about another aspect that I've been trying to um, look into when I started writing this book. There's many recipes that uh, are in common uh between jews and christians because you know when you live in a country you want to eat whatever everyone else in the country is eating um the fact that you're jewish doesn't mean you're not going to eat pasta or that you're not going to eat um like you know the rest of the population of the place where you live however uh the need of uh, eating kosher and the need of sticking to the rules of kasherut has um, over time led our cuisine to develop in slightly different ways than that of the um Catholic um, counterparts. How? For example, we um, had to start substituting some ingredients for others in order to be able to avoid mixing meat and milk. Um, if you think, for example, of lasagna, everybody wants to eat lasagna. However, unfortunately, from a kosher perspective, that's not a great dish because it contains milk that, and butter that go in the bechamel. Um, would I, would anyone want to have to give up on lasagna? No. So uh, the Jews of Italy started to cook in slightly different ways and adjust recipes to their dietary needs. So for example, they would swap um, milk with broth, butter with oil, so that you can still make, for example, a perfectly fine bechamel to go in your lasagna um, without using any uh, dairy products. By the same token, they yeah, wanted just, to be I able to- I just want to say that I, I... If I, I wish I'd known you when I was still living in Italy because it hadn't occurred to me to substitute broth for the, like, I don't know, you know, where have you been my whole life? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the easiest trick. Um, another trick that the Jews of Italy developed over, um, over centuries, especially in the north of Italy, um, was to consume goose instead of pork. 
So everybody wants to be able to eat prosciutto. Uh, why wouldn't we, if everyone else is eating prosciutto, you want prosciutto too and salami and all of the other nice types of um, charcuterie that are out there. So this is um, started cooking and preparing, um, cooking is not the right word, but started curing um, their own charcuterie products made with goose instead of pork. Um, pork is obviously a very uh, easy animal um, to farm, but so is goose, especially in Northern Italy that has a long tradition of um, um, farming uh, both geese and ducks. So the Jews, the Jews figured that this ingredient was, this animal as an ingredient was readily available, was easy to farm. Um, and you could really use it um, as people use pork. They could uh, use every single part of the animal and make something of it. Um, so they really created a tradition of uh, um, cooking with goose instead of pork. Now, that tradition, for example, is almost lost today. And that's one of the things that got me really stressed when I was researching for my book. Um, when I went to Venice, where, which is where um, a few people um, used to prepare these charcuterie products, uh, I came to realize that there were only two uh, fairly old, one lady and one gentleman people um, who still remember how to do how to prepare prosciutto from duck and do it maybe once a year uh, so once these two um, people will not be with us anymore uh, we will not have um, anyone who has that much of experience into making these products so i sat with them and i took pictures step by step um, of every single um, passage of the production of uh, Goods prosciutto. Um, but that's one of those if stories that got mistaken, me sort of. That's in the book, right? It's, uh, you, that, you, yeah. You um, that you yeah. 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 No, it's, it's in the book. You can try. Uh, it's a bit of a project, but it's uh, absolutely doable. Uh, it's just mostly a matter of being patient to let the meat um, cure. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's actually one of the reasons why I wrote this book. Because, for example, this is one of those traditions that are pretty much going to disappear over time. Um, because uh, those, I mean, on the one hand, it's the, it's the aging population. On the other hand, nobody wants to make prosciutto by hand, right? Um, but compared to other, you know, demanding activities that you can try and tackle in the kitchen, uh, this one is not even that demanding. It's just that uh, um, not many people have been exposed to it and have not uh, have learned how to do it. So. That's another one of those stories. And since I have it in the slides, you can also see a nice crostata up there. A crostata is a pie. Um, and that's another one of those things that we do slightly differently because um, most people in Italy would make their pastries with butter uh, and again, milk, but we never do. Um, most in, in most kosher households, uh, all of the pastries would be made with uh, oil um, instead of butter. You barely ever have any butter in your fridge uh would it be, would in it, it be in a, like uh what what is what's the most common oil that you use good question so i want to say people in italy are very selective about their oil obviously olive oil for cooking uh and for baking i want to say mostly um peanut or sunflower sometimes grapeseed but mostly peanut or sunflower canola for some reason has a really bad reputation in italy don't ask me why uh, so nobody uses it. And if you ever buy a blend of olive oil, of uh, different types of oil, your mother or someone in your family will scold you because you don't buy blends, you buy single seed. Um, that's how I've been raised and how I've seen it happening in most households. We also don't do margarine, which is counterintuitive because you would think that margarine would be a perfectly good product for us to use. But that is a really bad rep in Italy as well. So it's mostly sunflower and peanut. And I and I will say about the crostata, and we talked about this before. Um, there is a, uh, it's it's not the it's not the one that's pictured here. On sorry, I'm pointing to the slide of my. <laughs> um, the the there's a crostata with sour cherry and ricotta in this little tiny hole in the wall pastry shop in Rome. That when I had it, the yes, time, I literally cried. I'm not I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> so good. And there's a lot of good crostatas in Italy. You can find in Rome and anywhere. But but that is it, it's simple and 
magical. I, I mean, you have the, and you have the recipe as well. And I'm, I'm, I will try. Yes. I am. Unfortunately, I don't have the real recipe because the people of Bocione, which is the bakery that you mentioned, are very strict about their ownership of their recipes, and I understand it because they got like three items and they're really special. Uh, so it's as close as we as we could get. Uh, uh to imitate the original um uh, products so hopefully you will not be disappointed <laughs> uh, do you um, want, are you ready for the yeah, next i slide? might have you just change slide yes okay. uh oh it looks like i'm missing this page here but it doesn't matter so uh yeah thank you excellent so um, one of the things that you were raising before, Natasha, uh, quite rightly, is uh, how relevant is, geograph is the geographical fragmentation of Italy um, to the way its cuisine has developed over time. Um, the fact that Italy has uh, a variety of regions, uh, which all um, are very different from each other in terms of uh, agriculture, in terms of uh, um, you know, what the land looks like, and also which have historically been um, very different one from another, um, from a political perspective, has really led the food to develop in different ways uh, based on the region where you um, taste it. So I tried to walk you through uh, the peninsula from a Jewish food perspective, um, and then um, I'll, I'll try to also tell you a little bit about what dishes are there in each region that um, have a Jewish history. Um, so, so you get a bit of a tasting of the peninsula. So we can start from the south. If you change slide for me, thank you. Um, so we know about uh, um, central and southern Italy is that this, uh, this part of the country was home to the um, earliest Jewish settlements and communities there. Um, but like I said, that only lasted until the expulsion of uh, uh, the Jews from Spain, because uh, as I told you at the beginning, uh, that part of Italy belonged to Spain. Um, these Jews were Jews that had the opportunity to um, travel a lot. These, um, they traded in the Mediterranean with uh, um, all sorts of different cultures. With, uh, they traded with the Arabs, with the Normans, with uh, the Aragonese, with a number of um, other population nearby. And those um, populations taught uh, the Jews of Italy and then later at large um, Italians uh, to cook with a number of ingredients that uh, they um, previously didn't know or didn't know as well, such as artichokes, eggplants, which I mentioned before, um, fennel, cardoons, uh, as well as some spices. Um, so this was a substantial contribution that those Jews brought to Italy. And then as those uh, um, Southern Italian Jews had to migrate through the peninsula, um, they brought those ingredients further uh, up north. So when you, today there is not much. Oh, we lost you. We lost you. We can't hear you. There's a, there's a, okay. Sorry. Can you hear me now? You're back. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there, there's a few tiny communities like in Calabria, but there's pretty much nothing today that you can um, that you can experience firsthand in southern Italy um, left substantially. Now, uh, if we move further up north, and I might ask you kindly to change slide. Uh, this is again in a strange order, uh, but that's probably my slides. And we can just go up north with uh, that's fine. Yeah, Rome would have been great. Thank you. You want Rome? Yeah, Rome Pretty would good. have been great. Huh? Amazing. So some of those Jews uh, um, that were um, that migrated from southern Italy ended up in Rome. Now Rome is today our biggest Jewish community. Uh, there are between 13 and 20,000 Jews in Rome, depending how you count them. Um, and Rome is still one of the cities that is very interesting from a Jewish perspective, especially for the reason that I told you before, the existence of the ghetto. Because the ghetto preserved our culture. Uh, and still today, if you come to Rome, um, the Jewish heart of the city is where the ghetto used to be. That's where the synagogue is, that's where the uh, school is. Um, 
so we were lucky in a way that Rome had the ghetto because that ghetto really um, helped us preserve um, a number of stories and recipes that uh, um, that are uh, that are very valuable. Now, uh, Natasha, you 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 already spoiled the story of the of the boccione, the pasticceria. So um, that brings me to that same. Uh, past pastry shop that you mentioned before. Um, those who uh, get to visit Rome, if you ever have a chance, should at least try one um, Jewish dish of the Roman tradition, which is the one that you guys see in these pictures. Um, this is the so-called pizza de beride. Now, uh, you will realize that that's not a pizza uh, by any means. Uh, but the Romans have the habit of calling pizza pretty much anything that's flat. Um, so this is a fairly flat cookie and it's called pizza de beride. Beride means uh, it's colloquial for bar meat, uh, for brit mila. Um, and uh, so this is a cookie that is traditionally prepared for um, all of the happy occasions, but mostly for brit mila and is handed out to guests. Um, so if, if any of you ever goes to Rome, check out the bakery that uh, Natasha already mentioned. And this is another one of those dishes that is worth um, trying. I might have you pick another one of the slides at this point of your choice, uh, geography wise. So I, I lived in Trieste, so let's do Venice and Trieste. <laughs> Amazing. So um, uh, Venice and Trieste, yes. So we, we we went all the way up north now in the of the peninsula. We're moving towards Eastern Europe. Um, these uh, um, two cities have uh, a very interesting history, in particular Venice, because um, Venice was a the Jewish population of Venice was the result of a gathering of three different uh, um, Jewish. A dot, I want to say, like small in communities within the communities. Um, there were the Tedeschi Jews that came from Germany, um, and their contribution to Jewish Italian cuisine has been substantially what I mentioned earlier: the uh, adoption of goose and duck as, and their byproducts into our diet. Then there were the Ponentini Jews that came from Spain and Portugal. Remember, we said they were expelled from Spain, etc. So at some point they got up to the north of Italy. Um, and again, these people brought with them some really interesting ingredients that really defined um, the Jewish food of that area. For example, they brought marzipan, um, a, a number of our recipes and dishes, traditional, um, traditional ones feature marzipan as an ingredient. Uh, they brought salted cod. Um, which was obviously an ingredient that was used um, to preserve fish, um, to, to, to have preserved fish during long sea um, journeys, and citruses as well. Um, there's, um, well, I, I'll just skip uh, to the Levantini Jews and tell you more about the dish in the picture in a moment. Um, and then there were the Levantini Jews that came from the Levant, obviously Egypt, Syria, and Turkey, who also brought um, a specific combination of ingredients uh, that today we think of as Venetian, but it's again, Jewish. Um, they brought the habit of cooking fish and preserving fish with vinegar, pine nuts and raisins, which is an exquisitely Jewish combination in every, in most of our um, tradition, in a lot of our traditional Jewish dishes, pine nuts and raisins appear uh, as a classic ingredient. Um, and saor, which is what Venetians call these um, dishes that you, this dish that you see uh, on the right. This is a dish of sard, sarde, which are, which are like big sardines in saor. Saor means, uh, preserved with uh, uh, vinegar and uh, like I said, pine nuts and raisins. This preparation, which again, if you visit Venice today, everybody thinks of as a Venetian dish, uh, was pretty much a Jewish thing. Uh, it was the, Jewish fr the Jews from the Levant that uh, had taken the habit of preserving fish like that. And through their commerce with uh, Venice, they brought the recipe to Venice. Um, so, yeah, I just like to point out the. I just like to claim for us uh, uh, the recipes that we have some paternity over. Um, yeah, uh, I might have a skip uh, slide. No, wrong. We already did. So up in the north uh, still, but on the other side, there is the regions of Piedmont and Lombardy. Lombardy is actually where I come from. So 
these are not today. So Piedmont today doesn't have a very big Jewish presence. The biggest city is Torino, which is still nice to visit, but not uh, very relevant from a Jewish perspective. Um, however, Piedmont had uh, a very interesting Jewish history for centuries. And if you ever have enough time to travel the country, which I realize is ambitious, um, Piedmont has a number of beautiful synagogues and the old uh, Jewish communities where unfortunately pretty much nobody lives these days, um, but have uh, but have beautiful architecture, such as Casale Monferrato, Vercelli, Asti. Um, in these tiny cities, you find amazing, beautiful old synagogues uh, that maybe now get opened like, you know, once a year, but you can still visit them, uh, although nobody really prays, prays there anymore. Um, in Lombardy, which is where I come from, as I was saying, the biggest city is Milan. Uh, it's the second biggest Jewish community of Italy, um, but it's not one with a very relevant history because the Jewish history of Milan is relatively recent. Um, the uh, most relevant city from a historical perspective in Lombardy from a Jewish uh, point of view was Mantua. Um, and one of the things that again is sort of my obsession to reiterate uh, is that, for example, today we think of uh, the pumpkin as a very local ingredient that the people of Mantova are very uh, proud of. In the picture to the right, you can see the tortelli with uh, um, pumpkin, which is a local uh, recipe. Uh, but again, it was mostly the Jews who liked to cook with pumpkin. Um, they thought that pumpkin brought good luck. Uh, to this day, we consider it uh, one of the ingredients that we cook with for Rosh Hashanah, because um, it's supposed to um, be a well-wishing ingredient. Um, and it's, uh, it's really the Jewish obsession with this ingredient that eventually um, made it uh, sort of root in the territory and made it a local specialty. Now, all of the Jews are all of the Jews are gone. Um, most of those Jews migrated to other places. But uh, if you still visit Mantova, you you will find that this is a very, um, like I said, well uh, established and common ingredient. And so, even, even, even in, in, to even a certain even degree, Italy, in other parts, it's become. It's just been again absorbed yeah. into the food, and and I have to say, my favorite type of, of tortellini, but uh, uh, by far. Yeah, uh, they're <laughs> great. Yes. Uh, and I think we have one more slide and then we should actually be done with my deck, um, which is Tuscany. No, we miss Tuscany. There we go. Um, and then there's the region of Tuscany. Now, um, Tuscany also has a really interesting Jewish um, history. Uh, as I was telling you, the way the Jewish um, cuisine, but also at large, the way the Jewish um, culture evolved in the different regions is pretty much tied to how welcome the Jews were or were not uh, region by region. So there were regions that were obviously less welcoming to the Jews when you think about Rome and the Pope. Uh, Rome surely wasn't a great place to be. Um, but Tuscany historically has been fairly friendly to the Jews, uh, mostly because their political establishment, the, uh, the rulers of the land, were always aware of the fact that the Jews could bring good business. They were, you know, trade, trade merchants, people that worked um, and produced money, produced wealth. So um, in particular, the city of Leghorn uh, was always very welcoming towards its Jews. Um, this allowed us to have uh, blooming, blo blooming communities in many different cities of Tuscany, such as Florence, Pisa, Siena. Um, one of the cute ones that uh, people in the US hear about a lot is Pitigliano, uh, because it was mentioned in a previous um, Jewish-Italian cookbook many years ago. But uh, these were all cities with, a, uh, like I said, uh, flourishing Jewish community. Uh, and the Jews of this um, area contributed many dishes that are, um, again, very traditionally Jewish. Um, one, there's two stories that I like to tell. One is the, the fact that the adoption of couscous. Uh, today, people think of couscous in Italy mostly as an Arabic dish. Um, but for um, very many years, Couscous was considered a Jewish dish um, in, in, a, in a number of recipe books uh, and, and manuscripts. Uh, um, 
that existed in Italy at the time. Um, then for some reason, people have forgotten that it was the Jews that brought couscous to Italy. And today we just think of it as, you know, as a Middle Eastern dish um, or a Mediterranean dish. Um, a similar story is the story of Triglia alla Mosaica. Uh, if you visit Tuscany, there is a dish that you might come across called the Triglia alla Livornese. Triglie are red mullets, uh, they're a type of fish. Um, and they're cooked alla Livornese, which you would just think is the style of leghorn. Um, but when you look at the ingredients, that recipe overlaps 100% with a much older recipe, which was called Triglie, again, red mullets alla mosaica, uh, which was in the, which translates to in the style of Moses. Now there's a number of recipes um, that are recorded uh, with Jewish sounding names, like in the style of Moses or like the way Judith used to make it or in the style of Miriam. Um, and these were all obvious references to the fact that uh, these, these were Jewish recipes that the Jews um, prepared. Now over the centuries, and the fact that this was the red mullets in the style of Moses sort of got lost. And now we call it uh, the red mullets in the style of Leghorn. But there's no doubt that that recipe started out um, again as a Jewish recipe. So I just find fascinating, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here, um, the fact that there are so many um, bits and pieces of history and culture that the Jews have somehow contributed to Italian food. Um, that don't get uh, that the Jews don't get credited for. So I try to sort of raise some awareness of um, those recipes and stories. Um, things are never black and white, so you know we can try reconstruct some history. We can dig into the archives, see what's available, and do our best guesses. Um, but I just wouldn't want this to be, uh, the, and, and everything is up for debate. But on the other hand, I just felt it was really important to record these stories for as much as we know them. Um, and in particular, the recipes that are on the verge of getting lost, uh, just to you know make sure that there's a future for um, all of these stories and recipes. Well, I'm, we're gonna, you said you wrap it up here. People can pe uh, write to you here. They can contact you here or, um, I get, this is your Twitter, Instagram. Uh, that's no, sorry, it's your, email. Email. it's your email address. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you can also find me as Labna, wherever else you can find me, like Instagram and all of those places. Now you mentioned um, you mentioned another cookbook, and actually we have a question. Yes, and somebody uh, see that somebody mentioned it in the comments. Is that, is uh, yes, you're so, referring to Adam Macklin's. Yeah. That, that's actually the book I was uh, mentioning previously. Uh, unfortunately, that book went completely out of print and it's very hard to find. Um, and if I may say so, and I mean, I, I actually never met at the Sarri Machlin, so um, I, I actually feel really bad about it. She would have been a great person to meet uh, and interview. But her experience and the experience she recorded in the book um, is very, very um, Tuscan. Oh, we lost you. When again. I set out to write this book, I tried to give some um, visibility to all of the Jewish communities of Italy, because, uh, like I said, what uh, what Edda Sarmi Maklin called the Jewish food of Italy was actually pretty much the Jewish food of Tuscany, and very in particular, the Jewish food of the tiny village where she grew up, which, was, which is Pitigliano, the one I mentioned earlier. Um, but there is a lot more to our cuisine than that. So when I record, started to write all of these recipes down, I had like, I don't know, I wanna say 400, 500 recipes uh, from all over Italy. And I just try to give fair representation as much as possible to everybody. So, you know, a bit of Venice, a bit of Rome, a bit of Piedmont, um, to really try and describe the cuisine in a, you know, geographically fair way. Um, but that's a great book to have and whoever has a copy of that book should hold on to it because it's, like I said, pre pretty impossible to find. Um, I do want to say if you have questions, now's the time to ask them. Please feel free to, to, to put can your you questions. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, can, yeah, can you hear me? Benedetta, Sorry, I think I just lost uh, the sound again. Can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. Okay, gotcha.
Sorry, uh, what are you saying? When you were saying, or I was just telling telling people if they want to to ask questions, um, please put them in the chat. Uh, there is a comment here when you're talking about everything's up for debate, and actually, um, Eden says that she says actually eggplant was being happily eaten by wealthy Catholics in Italy in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, long before Arthusi's comments. Yeah, so um, like like she correctly said, um, there, there it, it's been recorded that it was uh, consumed in the sort of high end. Um, high classes, but then at some point it completely fell out of fashion, uh, as far as I know. Um, and then that rediscovery has been driven by the Jews. The same goes, for example, for saffron. Saffron was happily consumed uh, in the Middle Ages, then got sort of um, lost uh, track of, uh, and really came back only uh, centuries later. So. Yes, definitely there is evidence of eggplant being consumed, uh, but I want to say the larger adoption and the and the idea that uh, it, it it's a good food, like that everybody should give it a go, um, was substantially we think contributed um, a, a Jewish contribution. Uh, I see that somebody is asking about Passover recipes, <laughs> so the book is organized. A, um, a number of criteria, but one of them is the Jewish holidays. So there are, um, there's a short explanation of each Jewish holiday uh, and which foods are traditionally prepared in Italy for that Jewish holiday. Uh, and again, I try to represent all of the regions. So for every Jewish holiday, you'll find a few dishes from Rome, a few dishes from Venice, a few dishes from all of the cities. So depending where you go, Passover can look a lot different. Um, Rome is probably the best place to find yourself closely followed by Venice. Um, the Jews of Italy have a very, um, I, like to, I like to call it a strategic advantage um, over Passover because um, for generations um, we were allowed, and it's like a local tradition, to have a special flower certified by the rabbi where they know for sure that the um, grain from the very production of the grain all the way to the production of the flour has not touched any water or been in touch with any humidity. So there is, in these two communities in Rome and Venice, under rabbinical supervision for Passover, they make cookies. Uh, and those cookies are exactly like the cookies that you eat year around because they're made with this special flour. So uh, if you find yourself in Rome and Venice, you get to eat, uh, you know, regular cookies for Passover, despite the fact that it's Passover. Um, so they, they have a strategic advantage. Other than that, we do a great deal of baking with almonds, as I guess everybody does um, for Passover. Um, and uh, what else? One of the, I guess, traditional dishes that comes to mind, and Natasha, you might have seen it also in the ghetto in Rome, um, is pizzarelle, for example. Pizzarelle, again, anything flat is a pizza in Rome. So pizzarelle are um, little fritters that are made with matzo. Um, and those are a lot like, I want to say like matzo bray, but tiny and deep fried, um, which is very uh, traditional for the holiday of Passover. Um, so if, again, if you get the chance to visit Italy over Easter, over Passover, Rome, a great place to be. Um, um wait, there's so many questions. Give me one second. Let me read. Um, I can, I can read it out if you want. You don't have to worry because you're, you're on your special name. Uh, for, I don't know that, I don't know that we have a special name for Italian Jews. Uh, I mean, we call ourselves Ital Kim when we speak when we speak sometimes uh, but that would just be you know the hebrew um version of it i don't think we have uh a, another specific name uh and yes the whole debate about the artichokes being kosher um <laughs> that was such a mess in italy uh, just in case somebody for some reason uh, can't access the chat or something the question was are you familiar with the debacle a few years ago with one of israel's chief rabbis who said artichokes are not kosher yeah so that sparkled such a ridiculous debate in Italy because artichokes is, you know, one of those dishes that we um, are used to cooking and one of, mo of the most iconic dishes of um, our cuisine. Is, it's, is one, the, it's one of the few that across Italy carries the name. It's, it's Cacciofia del Giudia. So they're, they're Jewish, they're yeah. ju Jewish so, artichokes and everybody serves them that way and calls them that. Yeah. So uh, that's a very, very, I love this question. So 
There was a lot of debate. So we've always done it that way. Now, what the rabbi was trying to point out is that unfortunately, if you're like, if, if, you, have re if you hit really bad luck, Oh, we lost you again. Mm, insects, if there are some. You hear me? Okay, yeah, you, you're back now. Can you hear if, me? We lost you after if you said if you have really bad yes, luck. Yes, no, now I, now I can't hear you. Um, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Wait, so this is my... Uh, oh, damn, I'm sorry about... The, be the beauty of Zoom. Yep, gotcha. <laughs> No, it's not Zoom. It's like it's like I said, it's the fact that I should have been at home instead I'm in a car. Uh, <laughs> but we, we made it through. It's almost done. Uh, so the artichoke situation. So there might be bugs inside the artichokes and the leaves of the artichokes are so tight that this really big rabbi of Israel felt that uh, it's not safe. We might be accidentally eating bugs. Uh, now, we split the country into two parties. There's the party that says we've always done it that way. We will continue to do it that way. Um, never mind. We don't care. And then there is a couple of places that have started to try decompose the artichoke. Like they literally try to um, fry the leaves on their own after they sort of peel the artichokes entirely. Uh, that's not going well for them. Uh, the resulting dish is not great so um so you know you're gonna have to decide on which uh, side you want to be if you want to be on the side of being really um strict and adhere to the rules then especially the traditional fried artichoke can't happen but uh, but i want to say the vast majority of the population decided to thoroughly ignore um uh, the remarks of the rabbi and just continue to do it the way it was done. Uh, Italians in that way are very, you know, we, we don't mind breaking rules as a country. So I'm not surprised that um, we decided to break that rule too. Yeah, and in Italy, rules exist until they get in your way, and then you exactly, and then you yeah. sort of find the creative way to overcome. And somebody them. mentioned, uh, you know, that's the argument against strawberries that strawberries have bugs and aren't kosher. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to ask because you know, U.S. and Italian Jewish dishes can, can be so different, you know, and, and especially for the holidays, for celebrations. What is your comfort food? What is, what is, uh, good especially, especially you know, uh, when you're missing Italy here, when you're in L.A., missing Italy? So what, I think one of, one of my favorite foods that you can find in the book, and it's actually really good for the holiday that's uh, approaching for Passover, is the chocolate mousse. I can eat chocolate mousse for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and that's a good one for Passover because in particular, the one that we have in the book also turns into a cake. So it doubles as a mousse and as a cake. Uh, that's definitely one of my, um, like, you know, my favorite recipes. And sorry, I'm, I'm just following the debate in the, in the chat. Yes, unfortunately, the fact that the bugs are dead doesn't make them kosher. So um, those who <laughs> care should really not uh, fry the artichokes with the bugs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then to go back to your question, the chocolate mousse, and then probably, well, there is one dish that is very dear to my heart in the book, and that is probably worth mentioning because it, because uh, it, because I can tell you one more story about the Jews of Italy. One of my favorite foods ever is called the harami. Uh, as you can tell from the name, it's not technically an Italian dish. It's a dish from Libya, um, where practically it, it's just a fish in a really spicy hot uh, uh, tomato sauce. So one of the reasons why I ended up adding this dish to the book is that at some point in our history, um, Italy was didn't have that many Jews left. After, I mean, we did have some, but um, let's say the, the country suffered the heat from a Jewish perspective after World War II. Um, our population was shrinking. And we were lucky um, that we got a number of Jews from the Arab world uh, to move to Italy. Uh, and a substantial contribution of those Jews has been that of the Jews of uh, Libya. Libya was an Italian colony. Um, so when the Arabs started their uh, call them pogroms against uh, the local Jews, uh, the Jews of Libya, but for example, also the Jews of Lebanon, the Jews of many other countries, uh, moved to a friendly country that was just across the Mediterranean. Italy is a magnet for immigration from all sorts of places because it's just so, um, you know, it's just right there in the middle of the Mediterranean. So um, 
the Jewish population of Italy was revived uh, by the influx of uh, um, Jews from the Arab world that at some point arrived to the country. Uh, and the, the Jews of Libya in particular are, are probably the largest community together with the uh, Iranian Jews, the Persians that are everywhere. Um, and uh, they brought with them a number of recipes and stories that eventually you know, joined um, the uh, existing Italian Jewish tradition. And today, for example, if you visit Rome, in most uh, Jewish households, um, actually Rome is the place where there are uh, the most Jews from Libya, uh, in most Jewish households, you end up eating, uh, for example, on Shabbat, Chaimi or other dishes that the Jews of Libya brought with them from Libya. Uh, just because these are delicious dishes and Italians are smart when they find something yummy, uh, they just adopt it into their cuisine. So, um, so I tried to give a tiny bit of representation also to um, the sort of newer Italian Jews uh, that are not the original, uh, you know, first uh, um, comers, uh, but that have definitely revived um, our uh, community. Now you you are obviously, I mean, incredibly knowledgeable on on the subject and very passionate, and you've been writing about this for a long time. But even in compiling this cookbook, were there things that surprised you? Were there things that you discovered that you had? Um, well, I think that the thing that really surprised me, and I sort of hinted about it at the beginning, and it's not a positive surprise, is how small our communities are and how aging. Um, I never really said down to think about it but uh, over time as I was meeting people and chatting and you know trying to gather all of these recipes it really hit me that uh, it's an aging population and that you know the younger generations like myself they don't necessarily care they move they live abroad like I do and that there isn't really a next generation to pass these recipes down to uh, for demographical reasons so that was probably the thing that surprised me the most because you know we live in the day and we don't always think about you know what happens tomorrow and what what will be of us and the generations to come um so i was really surprised to see how small the numbers are and um yeah and how sort of urgent the preservation of all of these stories and recipe felt so that was that i that i was surprised about What's the most common feedback that you've gotten on the cookbook? Um, oh, good question. Uh, well, the, the book has uh, has been really well received. People have been really kind. Um, we got a lot of compliments. <laughs> um, but, I, have, uh, I do want to point out that all, in those slides are all your photographs and the book is beautifully photographed. Yeah, and Adetta, for those who weren't there at the beginning, is not just a food writer, but also a food photographer. So yeah, it's... Don't, don't truth be told, the, the, the book has been photographed by someone else. I was busy in the oh, kitchen. Okay. Oh, um, so some of those pictures are mine. Some of those are from my photographer. The photographer, the two pictures of the book, his name is Ray. Uh, he's amazing. Um, so feedback, people really like the pictures, like you actually said. Um, but I think the, the key feedback has been how surprising is this story as a whole. Like the people didn't know that there are Jews in Italy, the people didn't know that we have such a rich history. So I think it's the discovery of the topic itself that has really resonated with a lot of people. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I saw somebody was asking about the recording. Yeah. We, it'll be on the YouTube channel. So so this will be up, uh, I think in about a week or so for those who wanna rewatch it, for those who missed part of it. Um, are there any, there don't seem to be any more questions, are there? Um, thank you. I will. Well, thank you. And I have to apologize again for all of the, you know, technical challenges. Um, it's, this is it's, not it's, how it's, I usually yeah. need a call. But it uh, out. Thank, you for being, like it yeah. thank you for being able to do it from the car. That's great. It, it yeah, works. yeah, yeah. That's better than nothing. And I, and and I do want to point out that this for... is... I don't think we we mentioned this at the beginning, but this is this is the event in the book series that has had the most you know the highest number of participants so far and the most registrations. I really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Natasha, and thank you, Benedetta. It was such a wonderful conversation. I am dying to get back to Italy. I haven't <laughs> been there for over twenty years, so uh, I'm sure there's been a lot of changes since. Or maybe not. Oh, big time. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Huh? Yeah, I know. That seems to happen. But thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I do want to remind you. everyone 
about our next in-person event on April 3rd at the Parthenon with Alison Schachter, Professor of Jewish Studies, English, Russian, and Eastern European Studies. Alison will be in conversation with Vanderbilt Professor of Creative Writing, Nancy Reisman, who is also in a National Jewish Book Series Committee member. Um, and we will be talking, speaking about Alison's books, Women Writing Jewish Modernity and From Jewish Provinces, Selected Stories of Fredel Stock. Stock. Please uh, don't forget to check the rest of the author events at nashvillegcc.org slash book. And th again, thank you, Natasha. And thank you, Benedetta. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. It's made me, it's made me really homesick for, for Italy, which is so thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all.